So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Melanie Ott, who is at UCSF, the Gladstone Institute. And the title of her talk is Hepatitis C Virus Infection and Lipid Droplets, A New Connection to DGAT1, or DGAT1. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to talk here. Um, I think this is a fantastic symposium to bring together all the virology in the Bay Area and um, I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, my lab is interested in the pathogenesis of HIV and hepatitis C virus infection and obviously I'm going to talk about hepatitis C virus today. Um, just to remind you, it is a global a public health issue with about 270 to 300 million people infected worldwide. Um, and just to uh, briefly, briefly recap, it is a uh, blood-borne um, um, viral infection which has a unique propensity compared to other hepatitis viruses to establish a chronic infection in about 80 to 85 percent of people who come into contact with, uh, with the virus. Um, contrary to A and B, um, there is no vaccine available due to similar um, problems of um, um, variability of the virus that, uh, uh, that, uh, that are present in, in, in HIV. And yes, we do have a treatment, which is currently a combination of interferon and ribavirin, um, but this treatment is uh, rather cumbersome for the patients, and it is also not very effective against the, the genotype that's most prevalent here in the U.S. Um, hepatitis C virus infection has a unique uh, clinical symptom, which is that it causes a fattening of the liver, which is also caused steatosis. And in fact, um, in the 80% or 85% of people that develop a chronic infection, about half of them um, develop uh, clinical uh, signs of steatosis. And this is clinically relevant because steatosis impairs the treatment response. And it also promotes the um, progression to progressive liver disease, such as fibrosis, cirrhosis, and also liver cancer. Now, lipids um, also play a direct role uh, in the hepatitis C virus um, life cycle. Um, and I have marked them here as these yellow blobs in the cytoplasm, which, are, which represent lipid droplets, which are the storage droplets of neutral lipids in the cytoplasm. And it, um, it has emerged in the last um, um, three to four years that these lipid droplets are a major platform in the cytoplasm for viral assembly. Um, just to introduce you briefly to the virus, um, hepatitis C is a single positive strand RNA virus in the family of the flavivirus, similar to dengue, uh, who we, which, which we heard about this morning. Um, it, it enters the cell, the hepatocytes, we are receptor-mediated endocytosis, and the list here is really completely incomplete, um, and the list of the receptors are growing. Um, after translation, um, of a single polyprotein, which is um, processed into, um, into structural and non-structural proteins. The non-structural protein form an RNA replication complex with the um, um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase um, at its center. And these RNA replication complexes can really be situated anywhere in the cytoplasm at, at membranous structures, but a portion of it is recruited um, to the vicinity of these lipid droplets, and this portion is the portion that, that provides the RNA, the genomic RNA for encapsidation of uh, into progeny virions, and these progeny virions are assembled um, uh, at ER membranes close to lipid droplets, and they, um, they exit the cells using the lipoprotein secretion pathway. Now, my lab is really interested in this process of HCV assembly at lipid droplets, and here it's key to, to know that one viral protein, the, the nucleocapsid core, uh, directly localizes to the surface of these lipid droplets. And this localization to lipid droplets is key for the assembly process because it serves to recruit the RNA replication complexes to the vicinity of these uh, core-coded lipid droplets, and that uh, really orchestrates the, uh, the assembly of the uh, the individual particles. Um, so we, we were particularly interested in several questions. Um, how does core access uh, lipid droplets? Um, what types of lipid droplets are being utilized by a hepatitis C virus? 
and what does core coding of lipid droplets do to the lipid droplets themselves? And I, I'm trying to give you some answers during my talk to these questions. And the project in the lab was really um, 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 started um, by a very talented postdoc in the, lab, in the lab, Eva Herker, who focused her attention to a, particularly, uh, to a particular uh, group of enzymes, the so-called DGAD enzymes. And what are these enzymes? These are the critical um, uh, enzymes that um, uh, the critical enzymes in the triglyceride synthesis pathway. They, they mediate, they catalyze the, the final step of this triglyceride um, synthesis pathway, um, which is basically the addition of the last acyl group to diacylglycerol. And there's two DGADs in the, in the cell, DGAD1 and DGAD2. They both reside in the ER membrane. And although they, they, they uh, catalyze exactly the same biochemical um, reaction, they are structurally very different. And they're also obviously differently required for, um, for, for life because um, DGAD2 seems to be the more essential DGAD because DGAD2 knockout mice uh, die very early because of general lipopenia while DGAD1 knockout mice are relatively ha healthy. Now, why are the DGADs important for lipid droplets? They really produce the main constituents of lipid droplets, which is a core of neutral uh, lipids, which are triglycerides to 90% and some cholesterol esters. And the, the current model, how these um, enzymes are connected to lipid droplets is the following. Um, and this is a, a model I want to emphasize at this point, but the model is that the, the triglycerides produced by these uh, two enzymes are deposited uh, in between the two bilayers of the, of the ER membrane where they form a bubble, and this bubble eventually um, can butt with a phospholipid a monolayer surrounding it um, into the cytoplasm. And this phospholipid monolayer can um, host in a wide variety of lipid droplet associated proteins and these are under intense uh, research right now because um, A, the number of these proteins are increasing uh, by, by the day and, and B, it's not fully clear why this protein uh, is, are sitting on these lipid droplets and what they do to lipid droplets. Now, to find out whether these um, enzymes, the, these DGAD enzymes are important for HCV infection, um, we performed a very straightforward approach. We knocked them both down with shRNA in the HUH 7.5 hepatoma cell line, which is the only cell line that actually supports HCV replication in cell culture. And what we found is that uh, we found a difference. We found that uh, knockdown of DGAD2 really inhibited the spread of viral infection in these cultures, while the knockdown of DGAD2 uh, DGAD had no effect. And um, this is just the control to show you that um, knockdown has really occurred at the RNA level, and we also can show knockdown at the protein level for DGAD1, but we cannot show it for DGAD2 because we don't have a good antibody at this point. Now, uh, we, when we had this, ex um, this um, result, which showed a unique involvement of DGAD1, but not DGAD2 in the viral life cycle, we turned to a colleague at the Gladstone Institute, Bob Faris, who actually cloned DGAD1 and DGAD2 enzymes and uh, obtained a very useful reagent, which is a, a, a DGAD1, a specific DGAD1 inhibitor from them that Charlie Harris and Bob's lab had, had uh, very well characterized in vitro and showed that it is a specific DGAD1 inhibitor um, you, when, you, when it's used on purified enzymes. We used this inhibitor again in the infectious cell culture um, and found that production of infectious virions was um, reduced in a dose-dependent manner um, by the treatment of this inhibitor, and which we showed this in two different clones, the two clones that are currently available for HCV, the JFH1 parental clone and the um, JC1 lab-adapted clone. Um, now, to look further where in the viral life cycle this, in, uh, this inhibitor worked, we, um, we did a, a couple, a series of uh, experiments. I'm showing you here the RNA uh, quantification where we looked for a HCV RNA by QRT-PCR either within the cell or um, 
um, in the cell supernatant. And what we found is that the inhibitor really did not affect RNA replication within the cell, but it diminished the secretion uh, or the, the, it reduced the, uh, the amount of secreted RNA um, drastically. And this indicated that indeed the assembly or the secretion step um, was affected by, um, by the DGAD1 inhibitor treatment. Um, we, we further looked at infectious particles in the cell um, after DGAD1 inhibitor treatment to see whether we had a, um, an, an accumulation of infectious particles um, after treatment, which would indicate that we actually have a secretion defect, but didn't find this. We found that infectious particles were reduced within the cells and concluded that probably assembly is the step that is most affected by DGAD1 um, inhibition. And so, as I told you at the beginning, lipid droplets play an enormous role and, and a very important role in the viral assembly. So it would be very fitting that DGAD, that a triglyceride synthesizing enzyme um, had, an, had an effect in this, um, in this process. And one of our most straightforward speculations at this point was that DGAD1 is probably the main DGAD in the HUH 7.5 cells that were used for infection. And that when we use the DGAD1 inhibitor, we basically eliminate all lipid droplets and that would basically inhibit um, viral assembly very effectively. And this is when, the, when we had a big surprise because when we looked at the DGAD1 inhibitor treated cells, um, infected cells, um, and, and, and looked for lipid droplet content or size or lipid droplet numbers, we did not see any difference um, between the untreated cells, um, indicating that um, something more complex was at play here than just a, a simple elimination of all lipid droplets. And indeed, when we did the knockdown experiments with DGAD1 or DGAD2, um, we saw that knockdown of either of the, 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 the enzymes um, does not do anything to the, to the lipid droplet content in these hepatoma cells, meaning that if we knock down one, the other one can fully compensate for lipid droplet generation. However, when we knock them both down, there was really no lipid droplet left, and the lipid droplets are in, in green here. So we had to think about something more, um, more um, complex than just the simple um, elimination of um, lipid droplets here. And we turned to the, the core protein. As I told you, the core protein is the protein that is actually coding the lipid droplets and, um, and, and it plays an enormous role in the viral assembly process. And, um, Core, um, core the, 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 the model of the core translocation onto the lipid droplets is very straightforward, and it was developed by the McLaughlin lab in 2002, where they showed that core, which is actually the first protein of the polyprotein being produced, um, with a C-terminal anchor, is firmly um, anchored in the bilayer of the, um, of, the, um, of the AR membrane. However, after uh, intramembranous cleavage of this membrane anchor, the protein becomes more mobile and can be via lateral diffusion uh, migrate onto the surface of na na nascent um, um, uh, lipid droplets and with these lipid droplets basically butt into the cytoplasm. Um, so first, what we wanted to see is whether DGAD1 and core had any physical interactions, and we performed um, co-immunoprecipitation assays with FLAC DGAD1 or FLAC DGAD2 together with core, and find that indeed the core protein co-immunoprecipitated with, uh, with DGAD1, uh, but not with DGAD2. So there was a very specific interaction. Um, we also performed these experiments in the presence of the DGAD1 inhibitor to see whether this is simply disrupted, this interaction, and that would explain why the DGAD1 inhibitor had such an, 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 an effect in, in, in viral replication. However, this was not the case. If anything, the interaction was slightly enhanced with the DGAD1 inhibitor. We also looked at co-localization. Um, the DGAD1, as I told you, is an ER resident uh, protein, and this is um, uh, endogenous um, DGAD1 in the, in the HUH 7.5 hepatoma cells. Um, and you see it has a very typical ER localization, while the core protein really has this very punctate um, lipid droplet localization, and there is not much in the steady state, not, not much co localization. So we thought um, because the um, 
the, um, the, the residence of core in the ER is only transient, um, this time would be probably where the two proteins interact, while when the protein is loaded onto the lipid droplets, there is no more interactions. And we tested this hypothesis by using a specific mutant uh, of the core protein, which cannot be cleaved in its, uh, in its membrane anchor, and therefore cannot migrate onto the surface of lipid droplets. And indeed, when we looked at um, this mutant, which is completely ER resident, we have a, a, a nice co-localization with the DGAD1, indicating that um, DGAD1 and core probably interact before core goes onto the surface of lipid droplets. So our next speculation was that um, maybe the, the interaction of core with DGAD1 has anything to do with the core localization onto the lipid droplets, and maybe that's how the DGAD1 inhibitor um, interferes with, um, with the viral life cycle. Um, to do this, we um, isolated um, lipid droplets by gradient centrifugation from infected cells, uh, either treated with the DGAD1 <coughs> inhibitor or not, um, not treated, and found indeed that when we treat the cells with the DGAD1 inhibitor, the core localization to the lipid droplets is completely abrogated, while core is completely normally produced in the infected cells in the presence of the inhibitor. And we had to do a lot of controls. One of it is another protein, the NS3 protease, which is co-recruited with the core protein to uh, lipid droplets, is also diminished in its, um, in its association uh, with lipid droplets, while another very res uh, cellular uh, lipid droplet-associated protein, the ADRP, is completely unaffected. And our, our um, lipid droplet fractions are clean from any ER contamination. And again, here is a, a TG measure triglyceride measurement, and you see that the, the amount of triglyceride is not um, changed in the, in, the, in the presence of the, tri, uh, the DGAD1 inhibitor. Now, as I told you, the localization of core at the surface of lipid droplet really serves to recruit um, the RNA replicate or to orchestrate the recruitment of the RNA replication complexes um, close, to, uh, close to the lipid droplets, a, a step which is essential for the viral assembly. And so we wanted to see whether the DGAD1 inhibitor would also interrupt this recruitment of the RNA replication complexes. And we did this by immunofluorescence and infected cells treated with a DGAD1 inhibitor or not. And we used a very unique um, antibody, which is an antibody against double-stranded RNA, which very specifically recognizes the replicating RNA intermediates of the HCV um, 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 RNA in the infected cells, but does not recognize anything in uninfected cells. And as you can see, um, here, just in the, in, the, in the stain for the double-stranded RNA, the RNA replication complexes in their, in their, um, in their number is not really diminished in the, in the presence of the DGAD1 inhibitor, very much um, supporting the, the previous um, results showing that RNA replication levels are totally normal. However, when we looked at the co-localization of the RNA replication complexes, which are these blue dots with the lipid droplets, which are the red dots, um, we saw that while in the, in the mock treat in the DMSO-treated cells, you have an overlap of some of these replication complexes localizing to the lipid droplets in the DGAD1 inhibitor-treated cells, there's absolutely no decoration of lipid droplets with these RNA replication complexes. And this is also shown here in the quantification, demonstrating that indeed the, the disruption of, um, um, of the localization of core onto the surface of lipid droplets also disrupts the assembly process and the recruitment of the replication complexes. So this led us to um, the following model where we, um, where, we, where we propose that the core protein, when it's being produced at the ER, um, interacts with the DGAD1 um, enzyme, and that this interaction um, serves to, um, to concentrate the core pro protein in regions in the ER that um, that, um, that in, in which lipid droplets are being produced. And then in, this, um, in these regions, the core protein then can access the surface of lipid droplets um, and then serve at the surface of lipid droplets its function of orchestrating the assembly process. Um, if the, now, if the cell is treated with the DGAD1 inhibitor, the interaction still normally um, uh, occurs, but what doesn't occur is the production of the DGAD1-generated lipid droplets here. 
Um, so the, the DGAD1 inhibitor prevents the formation of these lipid droplets. And then since these lipid droplets are the only lipid droplets that the core protein can access, um, the core protein cannot access any lipid droplets, although there's plenty of lipid droplets around generated by DGAD2. Um, by DGAD and I think the, the, the interesting part of this finding is really twofold. One is to, to show that DGAD1 is, an, is a novel um, co cellular cofactor for HCV assembly. But the other one is that there's really different types of lipid droplets in the cells, those that are generated by DGAD1 and others that are generated by DGAD2. And um, what we show here is basically that, the, that HCV cannot randomly access any lipid droplet in the cytoplasm, but that it is very strictly dependent on the, um, on the, um, on the generation of newly formed DGAD1-generated lipid droplets. And this has um, major implications not only for um, HCV um, um, for HCV infection, but it also brings new, new light onto um, how lipid droplets form and, on, and what are the different types of lipid droplets in the cell. And we're very interested to, um, to pursue this further. So one of the implications, the very, very tangible implications of this work is that DGAD1 might be a novel target for antiviral therapy in HCV infection, and we, we're pursuing this further. But um, um, I want to show you some, um, un this, this work has all been published recently, but I want to show you some unpublished data here to show that DGAD1 has also other functions in the viral life cycle than what I've shown you here. And this is the work of Gregory Camus. He's a, a, a new postdoc from Paris who has looked at other viral proteins and their possible interaction um, with DGAD1. And he focused specifically on the NS5A protein, which is a non-structural protein, but also a very important protein for, um, for viral assembly because it basically shuttles the viral RNA um, to, the, um, to the lipid droplets. And he found that NS5A, like core uh, lipid droplet association, is also dependent on DGAD1. And in fact, he also shows that NS5A interacts with, um, with DGAD1. And he also shows an interesting finding because it's known that the core protein and NS5A can interact in cells, but this interaction is very weak. Um, and what we show is that this interaction is actually strengthened if you co-express the, uh, the, the DGAD1 enzyme here. So we, we, what we think here, and I'm, I'm making this very short because of time, is that it's not only the core protein, but also the NS5A protein, and these are the two proteins of HCV that can access lipid droplets, um, that these basically form a trimolecular complex with the DGAD1 enzyme in the ER, and that this serves to actually load the two viral proteins onto the same type of lipid droplets in the cytoplasm, so that they can coordinately uh, perform their, um, their effect in, uh, in viral assembly, and that the treatment with the DGAD1 inhibitor not only targets core, but also targets the NS5A protein. But I want to, I want to, and the imp implication here is that DGAD1 functions as a cellular hub for HCV proteins that access lipid droplets, and we think that probably cellular proteins also benefit from that function. But I want to, want to spend my last three minutes on another project, which is performed in, in close collaboration with the Faris lab, and here is Charlie Harris together with um, Eva, where we look closer at what the core protein at the surface of lipid droplets does to the, to the lipid droplets itself. And this comes back to the initial um, slide where I showed you that steatosis is an important uh, clinical feature of hepatitis C virus infection. And this steatosis can be recapitulated just in transgenic mice expressing the core protein. So this has um, for a long time implicated the core protein directly into the generation of steatosis in patients. And so what we, um, what we tested was whether DGAD1 plays any role in that steatosis um, uh, this property of, of, of core to, de, 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 to generate, um, to cause steatosis. And we um, did this very straightforward. We used the DGAD1 knockout mice uh, and the wild-type mice, injected them with an adenovirus, 
um, expressing core and then looked for steatosis and the localization of core in the, in the, in the liver. And what we find, or what I'm showing you here, is the core expression either in the wild type or in the DGAD1, knock, uh, in the DGAD1 knockout mice. And you see that core is expressed nicely in both. However, when we looked at the triglyceride levels in these mice, we found them uh, triglycerides only elevated in the livers of the wild type core expressing mice, but not the DGAD1 knockout core expressing mice. Um, indicating that, and this is the quantification, indicating that DGAD1 is required for the um, f um, property of core to induce um, steatosis. And we link this to the, um, to, the, to the story that I showed you before, where we show that actually uh, also in vivo, DGAD1 is absolutely required for the core protein to access lipid droplets. And this is the sucrose gradient of the, um, um, of the uh, livers, um, of the infected livers. And you see that only um, in the vault type uh, core can um, access lipid droplets while it's missing in the DGAD1 knockout mice. And this really brings um, home the point that um, the steatotic effect of, 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 of core is connected to the effect of core to access lipid droplets. And this is not a new concept in lipid droplet binding uh, proteins because we have several examples, including perilipin and adipocytes, where the coding of proteins um, of, the, of the lipid droplets with specific proteins actually regulates the rate how these lipid droplets are turned over. And so we measured the turnover rate of core-coded lipid droplets versus non-core-coded lipid droplets. And this is done in an NIH uh, 3T3 assay where we infected the cell with a retrovirus expressing core. Then you pulse the cells with radioactive oleate. And then you add an, a drug called triaxin C, which um, prevents the reesterification of the released fatty acid. And you basically do a chase over time to see how basically the, 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 the radioactive uh, triglycerides are going to be turned over. And what we found is that indeed, um, in the core expressing mice, the, um, in the core expressing cells, the rate of lipolysis or the rate of turnover of these um, lipid droplets is, is, um, is significantly delayed. And this is also shown here where you, in, in the immunofluorescence picture, where after 24 hours in the control cells, there's basically no lipid droplet left. However, in the core expressing cells, you have these um, 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 bundles of lipid droplets that are remaining. And all of these lipid droplets are coded with the core protein, really um, underscoring the, uh, the model that, um, that the core coding prevents these lipid droplets from being turned over. And when we use the SPMT mutant, which um, does not localize to lipid droplets, we also have no protective effect. So in summary, what I've shown you here is um, a mechanism um, how the core protein access lipid droplets uh, generated by DGAD1 via the DGAD1 enzyme, and that this is important for the recruitment of the RNA replication um, um, complexes and the assembly, and that the DGAD in inhibitor basically prevents the formation of these lipid droplets and therefore prevents access of core to lipid droplets in general. I've also shown you that this is not unique to core, but that NS5A and other viral proteins does this, does the same thing. And in fact, we have tested all the viral proteins. It's only these two that interact with DGAD1 and that access lipid droplets in a DGAD1 dependent manner. And we think they're doing this in a trimolecular complex. And we, we think they're doing it to, to have all the components of the assembly machinery at the same type of lipid droplet. And then I showed you that the core protein and not the NS5A protein, but the core protein coding the lipid droplets actually increases the stability of these lipid droplets in the cytoplasm, which may serve to actually have better replication because more stable uh, assembly platforms in the cytoplasm, but can also lead to clinically overt um, steatosis. So I want to end here by acknowledging the people. I already acknowledged Gregory, Gregory and Eva. Um, Eva really did the, the, the most part of um, the data that I've shown you here. I want to um, very much acknowledge our collaborators, Charlie Harris and Bob Fries, who are um, very important collaborators on this um, project. I want to acknowledge all the colleagues who provided us with important reagents and my funding sources. Thank you for your attention. I've been asked to wait for the
the microphone because it's being filmed. So, although is it my turn? <laughs> That doesn't have the enzyme. This mouse is actually pretty happy. It's also oh, what's the what's the phenotype of the DGAD one uh, knockout mouse? Um, it has a normal. It has actually a prolonged lifespan, and it's leaner than normal mice. <laughs> but it is not. Uh, it, it, the, the the enzyme doesn't seem to be required for the general. Um, production of, um, of of lipid droplets or, or triglycerides in the in the um, in the organism, and this is in striking difference to the DGAD2 knockout, which dies very early um, at birth of general lipopenia. And there's um, yeah, there's very I mean very from our side and from many people in the in the in the in the, in the DGAD field or in the lipid field, there's a high interest in finding out what is really the relevant difference between the two enzymes and are they really producing different types of um, um, lipid droplets? Are they localized at different localizations? There's a whole connection to the lipoprotein pathway that is controversial but might be important here because we know that, that HCV utilizes the lipoprotein pathway and so TGAD1 might be the bridge but um, we don't know yet. So my understanding is uh, the interaction between the core and DGAT1 occurs outside the liquid, uh, lipid uh, droplets. Yes. Is it known how this interaction is regulated so that it's sort of transient? It will only deliver a core, not the DGAT1 itself, into the droplets? Yes. So the DGAT1 itself is actually um, a very, it's a, it's a five membrane, five times membrane spanning protein. It has absolutely no chance to go on lipid droplets because it basically spans both layers of the ER membrane, and, um, and we cannot find it at, in any time at, at lipid droplets itself, also we have looked very hard. Um, DGA2, in contrary, has been described to go on lipid droplets. We, we don't see this very well, but in the overexpression system, you can see that it goes on to lipid droplets. So um, we don't know yet whether the, um, you know, how the interaction is regulated, to come back to your question. We were working very hard on it. We're working especially hard on core mutants to see whether we find something that does not interact to actually support our model that the interaction is the, the really relevant thing. Um, another model that we're pursuing is that the DGAT could actually modify the core protein itself and not, um, you know, only the diacylglycerol. So we're looking very much at acylation of the core protein because that would also explain why the activity needs to be um, suppressed for, or is sufficient to be suppressed for the effect on, 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 on viral replication. So there's, I mean, this is a model. You're right, the interaction is not fully defined, but we, we're working on it. Final question? Um, MIR-122 Mir um, is an important um, yes. cofactor in <laughs> So I was wondering, is there any kind of interaction between DGAT and the MIR-122? We have not know? looked, and, uh, but we might. <laughs> okay. Thank you.